Next one, next one, next one. Uh, the oath of office, lower, next document. No, no, below that, below, same, same page. Second page, second page, yeah, yeah. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, since uh, this afternoon is about uh, rediscovering our roots, while Father Fio will be taking us through the Malines documents, uh, Malines is one of the dioceses in Belgium where Cardinal Suenens was in charge of the diocese. And so these documents have got this name Malines documents. There are three documents uh, that define the charismatic, that define who we are and that in a way uh, tell us of our jurisdiction within the church and what we are expected to do and how we go about doing this, all right? Uh, while Father Few will be taking that, I want to go to the other aspect of the roots and that is who we are, all right? Who we are as the charismatic. Very often when we look at different groups in the charismatic, uh, uh, sorry, in, in the church, we are looking at, uh, we've got the church in general, and then we've got the group of the charismatic, we've got the group of the Legion of Mary, we've got the SVP, etc. So what's really the difference between the church as a whole and these specific groups? In the church hierarchy too, you will find that you have the priesthood, <coughs> And then you have different orders like the Jesuits, okay? You'll have the Salatians, you'll have different things. So the same aspect that is there in the priesthood is also the aspect that we look at in, uh, in the church, in the functioning of the church, all right? Now all these orders, like in an army, you'd have the infantry, you'd have the whole army, but then you'd have commandos, you'd have special forces, etc. What do these people do? They do specific tasks. That doesn't mean they don't fight the enemy. They all do the same thing, but they are trained specifically to explore a certain task, okay? So in the army, etc., they call the elite forces. We are not the elite forces, all right? We are not called to be an elite force. That means separate, all right? But we are called to go deeper into the spirituality of the Lord. Right? So that is basically who we are as the charismatic or as the Legion of Mary, etc., whatever group we are. Right? In the whole church, we have Christians, and then within the Christians, we have people who explore in a deeper manner one aspect of spirituality, one or more aspects of spirituality. Right? So that is what we are doing now. What I've put, down, put up here is the oath of office taken by the office bearers. Okay, so this is the first thing we started this year. And this oath is what we take as priests. This is downloaded from the Vatican site. Okay, so it is something that anyone undertaking a, an office in the church would swear. All right, this is part of taking an oath of office. That means I'm elected to an office or I'm selected to an office and this is the oath that I take. Now each of these oaths are similar in nature but they've got slight differences depending on the office, depending on the group, etc. Right? So I signed the same oath as a priest, right? But of course mine had another paragraph, it had other oaths attached to it, so on and so forth. Now all of us as Christians also take an oath. Do you know which one? Baptism. No. Okay, those are the sacraments. All of us take an oath every Sunday. I believe. Very good. Okay. So, at the Easter Vigil, at the Easter Liturgy, if you remember, there is the profession of faith. Right? And the profession of faith at the Easter Vigil is like a little more elaborate thing and it's got two parts. The first part is, do you reject Satan and all his works and all his empty promises? Okay, that's the first part. Do you reject this? Second, okay, now that you've rejected this, do you accept this? Do you accept? Do you believe in God the Father, the Creator? Do you believe in the Son, the Redeemer? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, etc.? This is the basic, the core of our faith, the core of our belief, the core of our calling, right? Now within this, we have further developments for specific needs. 
So for the priesthood we have something, for the others we have something. And so today what I'm going to talk to you about is based on this oath. But this oath is not just something that we have created or the church has created. This in turn is basically what every Christian is called to do. Okay, so we as the charismatic are called to be Christian first. Okay, but as the charismatic to go deeper into that Christianity. Okay, to go deeper into that Christianity and the hallmark are the charisms, the gifts that we are given for what? To build up the body of Christ that is a church, all right? Never to show off, never to say this or that or to say I've got this gift, etc. No. The gifts are to be operated within the mind and the heart of the church, within the specification of the church. Clear? Okay. Now, if you look at the oath of office that is there, all right, there are different parts to it. The first part is, I swear as I take over this office, etc., that I will do this and I will do that. What are the things that a person swears to do? Basically, to model himself or herself into the image of Christ, to become more and more Christ-like. At the heart of this oath is that one very specific thing, all right? And we can look at three areas that are mentioned in this oath. The first is prayer, okay? I promise when I take up this office, to be a person of prayer and we'll develop that later. The second is to be a person of service. Okay, that means I am called first and foremost to be a servant. Servant to whom? To the church and as part of the church to the world. To bring Jesus to the world, right? We often sing that hymn, make me a servant humble and meek. That's exactly what we are called to do. The third part is to be communitarian, to bring everyone together, to develop communication, okay? So, if you notice these three, prayer is relationship, service is relationship, communication and community life is relationship, right? So, in other words, we are called to build relationships. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. Can you imagine if one cell of your body doesn't communicate with the other cell, what will happen? Suppose one cell says, ah, I'm not interested in you. I can manage by myself. I've got these gifts. There will be a collapse in the body. And therefore, what we are really swearing is that we are going to operate as one body in the name of the church, for the church, and for Jesus Christ in the world. Okay? So... When we look at our lives, this is what all of us must adhere to. If we don't do these basic things, all right, if we don't do these basic things, it's questionable whether we are actually charismatic. In fact, whether we are actually even Christian. All right, so the charismatic, as I said, is a step not higher, it's a step deeper into the life of the church. Just as the Legion of Mary, the SVP, etc. is a step deeper, so too is the charismatic. We are not the elite. We are the people who dig and burrow deep within. We go into the heart of who Jesus is. And therefore, the deeper you go, the more specialized you need to be. All right? And therefore, what must be my prayer life? What must be my prayer life? What is the basic minimum that I must have when I speak of my prayer? First is my own personal prayer. My personal relationship with Jesus. Okay? If I haven't met Jesus, I can never lead anybody to Jesus. As simple as that. I can't give whom I don't have. I can't give that which I don't have. All right. So the first thing is a personal relationship with Jesus. I must have had to met Jesus. So in the prayer aspect, I've got to deepen this relationship with Jesus. So it is taken for granted that I've met Jesus. I've had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now I must deepen this relationship. 
just as you join a new office you have a new colleague you become friends and then you deepen that relationship in the same way i have met jesus i have experienced the holy spirit the baptism of the spirit now i must go deeper how do i how do i go deeper i go deeper by a life of deep prayer what do i mean by this sitting in front of the blessed sacrament first no other option is available if i want to meet a friend i have to meet a friend i cannot coordinate with jesus over whatsapp and over facebook doesn't work i may be in touch with people that way but it is always better to meet face to face i must be with the lord and what do i do when i go to the lord what do i do when i go to the lord four steps acts remember acts of the apostles easy to remember first adoration second contrition okay third thanksgiving and fourth supplication very good okay so very simple this is the formula that the church has given us down the ages this is not something that we have come in with all right this is something that the church has always recommended and is always practicing all right the basic thing that i need to do is go and adore jesus and because i adore jesus i pour out my heart to him and because i pour out of my heart to him i thank him for listening to me and because he listens to me i say lord i need help here okay that's the first thing the second aspect of prayer is a deeply sacramental life i cannot be a sunday catholic i need to be more than that i need to receive especially the sacrament of the eucharist and the sacrament of confession as often as possible as often as possible the eucharist practically every day if possible that strengthens me pope francis tells us the eucharist is not a prize for someone who is virtuous and righteous it's a medicine for someone who's sick am i sick yeah definitely do i need medicine yes and therefore who is going to give me that medicine the eternal physician jesus and what is the medicine my flesh is food for the life of the world my flesh is real food we need his flesh nothing else will do no compromise there the second is regular confession regular confession because not because you have to say sorry about everything very often we've abused the confession and thought of the confession as one dhobi guard no as a washing machine i go bless me father for i have sinned and then rattle off a whole line of sins what exactly is happening in the confession story of the prodigal son the prodigal son realizes that he has messed up he prepares one long speech and he goes to his father at the moment the father sees him coming the father runs and embraces him and he starts his marketing speech no father i have sinned against heaven and against you okay what does the father do he embraces him he tells the servant put the ring put the sandal get the best cloak slaughter the fattened calf what's the point of this story the point of this story that is that confession is not primarily about confessing sins that is a part of it but that's a secondary part the first part is always coming to god meeting god look at the book of genesis when adam and eve sin what is god's first question adam where are you it's not adam what you have done what have you done no that question is not even asked that's asked only later the first question is where are you and that is the question that the lord asks us every day where are you how much of your life today have you given me how aware have you been of me and so this is what a life of prayer is a life that is sacramental many of us go to the eucharist 
And many of us sometimes find the Eucharist very dry and boring. I felt that way too, once upon a time. But then I didn't understand the Eucharist. And I went because it was an obligation. Because I felt I would get more and more graces and become a better person. But once you realize what the Eucharist is, what exactly is happening there, how do you prepare for the Eucharist, you'd realize what a beautiful experience it is. When you go to the Eucharist, what exactly is taking place on that altar? What's happening there? The sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice. How do you recognize it as a sacrifice? How do you recognize it as a sacrifice? How do you recognize it as the death and resurrection of Jesus? Have you noticed what the priest does? He consecrates bread and wine separately. Have you ever seen him consecrating both together? Let's finish the mass quickly. Okay, this is my body and this is my blood which is given up for you. Never. Have you ever asked why? Because what happens when the body is separated from the blood? Death. If I remove the blood from your body, you will die. So we celebrate the death of Jesus. And then before, we have the Lamb of God. The priest breaks the bread and puts a piece of the bread into the wine. Now the body and blood have come together. What do we have? Life, the resurrection. So we're not just celebrating anything. But who sacrifices it? That's another problem. It is the sacrifice of Jesus. But is it your sacrifice? Let's try, let's try, okay? Pray, my dear brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. So what is your sacrifice? Where is your sacrifice? Your body and your blood is still with you. Where is your sacrifice? And when did you give your life? So because I don't prepare for a sacrifice, I offer nothing to the Lord. I have nothing to offer. I don't come prepared with a sacrifice. Three things must always be brought to the Eucharist. Remember this. S-I-S, short form for sister. Alright, don't bring your sister. Okay, but S-I-S. The first is my sacrifice. What is my sacrifice? What is my sacrifice? I don't like doing certain things, but I go out of my way to do it because Jesus has taught me. Not because my parents taught me good manners and I must help out. Not because of that. Because I recognize Jesus wants me to do that. And so I don't feel like doing it, but I go out of my way to do it. So sacrifice. What are the sacrifices I have made during the day? What are the sacrifices I have made during the day? The second are my intercessions. What am I there to pray for? You know, very often we go for Mass. What are we there to pray for every day? At every Mass? Have you ever asked yourself, why am I going there? What am I going to pray for at Mass today? Many people tell us, pray for me, pray for me. Yes, yes, don't worry, I'm praying for you. Do you remember them at Mass? Some of us do, some of them we do. So, the Mass, you've got to bring your intentions. And the third most important thing, which you have created, your sin. Bring your sin to the Lord. That is the sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice is offered for what? This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. What sins have you brought? Nothing. So when the priest at the beginning says the penitential rite and he says, let us pray and he pauses for a while, it's not because he's searching where the prayer has gone. It's there in front of him. It's because he's giving you time to offer that sin. Notice how many times you say sorry in the mass. I confess, Lord have mercy. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Okay? 
and any number of times in between. Why? Because the Lord wants you to bring your sins. So the sacramental life is not an empty life. It's not about doing some rituals. It's about immersing yourself in these rituals. Okay? The sacramental life is that third. The prayer is uh, reflecting, reading and reflecting on the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word. God's word guides me. So these three aspects constitute prayer. The second part is that of service. The Son of Man came to be served. Is it? Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And what are we doing? How many are we serving? That's the whole question. As a Christian, I am called to serve. I am called to serve. And so I must challenge myself to reach out in service. And service means it is difficult. I break my body, as St. Paul will tell us, so that the body of Christ may grow. I need to give of myself. To serve is to offer sacrifice. To serve is to offer sacrifice. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When you reach out in service, you become another Christ. And therefore, what must we serve? Who must we serve? First, at the Karas root, my family. My family. I don't go and work in the church and in the CCR at the cost of my family. Why? Because that is where God has appointed me. I must serve within my family. The second is my parish. God has planted me in that parish. There are needs in the parish. I must seek out these needs. Seek out. Don't wait for your parish priest to come and tell you. He may not notice you. What happens? You'll say, oh, well, I'm not going to serve. No, you are called to serve. That is your identity. And if you don't do this, then there's something wrong with you and me as Christians. We are called to serve. Notice Jesus. He's been preaching the whole day. He is tired. He wants to go away and then he sees a large crowd and he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. And what does he do? He sets himself to teach them at length. Want to be like Jesus? It's a difficult road. But it's a road of joy. It's a joy that the world cannot give. It's a road of satisfaction. Of deep satisfaction. Service. Reaching out. Third, the poor. Reaching out to the poor. Poor not just who are economically, financially poor, but poor who are lonely, who have no one to buy by their side, poor who are homebound, who can't go out, poor who are suffering a mental onslaught, depression, poor who are physically poor, economically, financially poor. How many of our ministries revolve around this? Intercession, I pray for them and then God will take care of them. Now what does St. James tell us? If there's somebody who is hungry, what must you do? Tell him I'll pray for you. Your hunger will be satisfied. No, give him something to eat. So the principle in the church is you cannot teach theology on an empty stomach. That's why we gave you lunch first. Okay? So, as they say, Adi Potoba, Nantar Vitoba. No? So, we need to address our human needs. I will not feel good really inside if I see... How many of us are really happy looking at beggars? Say, yeah, yeah, I saw one beggar. How many of us do that? Why? Because poverty affects us. We may not want to accept it. But none of us are happy looking at beggars. How many of us are happy looking at people suffering? No one. Why? Because suffering is not Christian. Suffering is not what God created. 
we are affected by it. Maybe we may not take cognizance of it. I may turn the other side, but I turn the other side because it affects me. And therefore, I must do something about what affects me. And third, involvement in the ministries of the parish. Ministries of the parish. When am I going to involve myself in these? The ministries of the parish. This is what prayer entails. This is what service entails. And third, communion and communication. How do I relate to people? I fought with someone, I can't look at that person's face. Very nice community you've built. And I know it's difficult, I struggle with it also. So I'm not pointing fingers at anyone here, right? But recognize this is the challenge that the Lord gives us. On the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. When I am suffering and people are mocking me, do I say the same thing? That's the challenge now of Christianity. That is what it means to go deeper into Christianity. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Follow the commandments. Which ones? Honor your father and mother, don't kill, don't commit adultery, etc. Okay, I've done all these. What more must I do? Ah, so you want to go deeper? Good. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, come follow me. So you're charismatic. You want to go deeper? Yes. Are you happy with the surface? You want to go deeper? Yes. Well, sell your pride, sell your ego, sell your possessions, sell everything that possesses you and come follow the Lord. This doesn't mean that I have already done everything. I struggle with the very same things. All of us do. But all of us must push ourselves to becoming holy. The challenge of Christianity, the challenge of the charismatic group is to embrace greater holiness. Greater holiness. And holiness is seen primarily in relationship. Is God holy? Yes. What is God? Who is God? He's a relationship, Father, Son and Spirit. Everything that we need to know about holiness, we get from God. God is a relationship of persons, one God. There is unity in the Trinity. Three distinct persons, but one God. We are 72 groups around Mumbai, but one CCR. But are we? That's the whole point. In my prayer group, we are one prayer group. We are different ministries, but are we one? In my parish, we are one parish, but are we like Benner's horses going in all different directions? That's really the challenge. And that is the prayer of Jesus. Lord, that they may be one as you and I are one. That time he prayed for us. He knew the nonsense we'll undertake. He knew how pride and ego and all kinds of things will come up. But the challenge of being a charismatic is being honest. Honest. Honest before God with myself. Honest with my conscience. And if I've goofed up, I've goofed up. Lord, I'm sorry. I should not have done this, but I've done this. I've made a mess. No problem. Start again. Start again. And that's the whole point of the confession. Lord, you love me so much that I'm ready to lay down all my cards before you. These are the good things I've done, but these are like really bad and pathetic. And what does the Lord do? Good. Start again. Let's do this together one more time. That's exactly what the Lord does with us. When you are honest with God, you will be honest with your relationships with people. If you are dishonest with God, you will always be dishonest with people. That's the basics of theology. Basics. If you can't be honest with God, you will never be able to be honest with people. Because people pass judgments, no? And you can see the reactions. But God only looks at you with love. He doesn't pass judgment on you. He is happy that you have returned. He embraces you. Prodigal son. You've come back. You were dead, but now you are alive. So this is what we are talking about when we speak of this. 
Now, there should also be, when I say honesty, I also mean transparency. I must be transparent in my dealings with people. Be transparent in my ministry. Be transparent in the funds that I handle. These are not, these are not mine. I am a steward of these. And I have to be accountable to these things. I have to give an account of all these. If God has given me gifts, I have to be accountable for those gifts. How am I using those gifts? Am I honest about those things? So transparency. And all these things, how do they come together? They come together in spiritual direction. Now this is a big bad word. Big bad word. You know why? What's a spiritual director? Who's a spiritual director? No, who is who is this? not who is the spiritual director of the CCR? What do you mean by a spiritual director? Who is a spiritual director? Exactly the problem. So very often when we speak of spiritual direction, we equate it with a confessor. Isn't it? My spiritual director is the one whom I go to for confession. That's what's in my mind. Isn't it? So my spiritual director is someone who I go for confession, but like a prolonged confession. Isn't it? It's not like a one-off confession. I go to that person regularly. He's my confessor. That's a spiritual director. Isn't it? Wrong. That's not a spiritual director. That's a confessor. So what then is spiritual direction? Spiritual direction is when you take all of the above that I have said, your prayer, your service, your communication, your communion, everything, and say, this is my life. Now help me out here. It's not about your sin, it's not about making a confession. That may be part of it. But a spiritual director is expected to guide the spirit within you. To discern the spirit within you. These things you have done, is it from the spirit of God, from your human spirit or from the temptation of the evil one? All the things that you are planning and that you are chalking out for your group, is this what God wants or is this what you want? Or is this because you have nothing better to do? And so we've got four meetings in a month. Now first meeting what we'll do. Uh, first meeting we'll have praise and worship and adoration. So one, one day is over. Second meeting, second week what will we do? Uh, intercession? Intercession. I have to fill up the calendar. No. That's because you're not being creative. That's because you're not asking God what to do. A spiritual director is expected to look at what you are doing and to give you a kick on the backside when required. That's the job of a spiritual director. And it's a very difficult job. And all of us need a spiritual director. Why? Because when we have to judge, no? We judge outside people very well. But when it comes to us, we use a different yardstick, isn't it? So even when I go to confession sometimes, the priest only absolves me or deals with me based on what I have said. So confessor is for confession. But a spiritual director will needle me, will ask me, why have you done this? On what basis have you done that? Who has asked you to do this? He will dissect your life. He or she, it can be anybody. He or she will dissect your life and help you see things. You see, it's the luxury of a spiritual director not to be involved directly in what is happening. He stands on the outside and therefore is able to look at things objectively. He has what is called a view from nowhere, a view from outside, not a view from being in the mela, or being in the mess. I'm busy in my life and I'm judging my life. And I'm giving excuses because I know what I'm going through. And so my judgment is very subjective. But when it comes to spiritual direction, there is black and there is white. And we need somebody to tell us that. 
And so each one of us needs a spiritual director. Somebody who is going to be tough with us. So don't choose your best friend. Don't choose somebody who is very nice and lenient. But choose someone who is spiritual. Choose someone who means no nonsense. And choose someone who can show you the right direction. That's important. Somebody who will tell you when you are wrong. Who will pull you up. That is a true friend. That is a true, true guide. We need spiritual directors. And I want to emphasize this. Not because I am the spiritual director. Because I have one myself. And one who is extremely strict with me. Extremely strict. But we need someone to look at our lives objectively and point out the little messes we make, the little wrong turns we take here and there. That's the job of a spiritual director. And therefore, each one of us, I want to encourage you. You can have whoever is your confessor and there's no problem with that. And maybe your confessor can also be a spiritual director. Okay, but make sure you have a spiritual director, each one of you. You are leaders. You are to lead the group. If you are in a mess, who will save your group? You realize the responsibility you hold? Tremendous. Tremendous. You are the face of the charismatic in your parish. What do people know about the charismatic? They only know what the prayer group does. And if you do nonsense, what a bad reputation you're creating for the CCR. So you recognize, you recognize the responsibility on your shoulders. So this is why we've given them this oath. This oath is not about just doing things. It's about being honest. It's about obedience to superiors. Whatever the bishop says, the bishop is the safeguard of the faith. He says, do it, I do it. He says, don't do it, I don't do it. And his delegates, who is the bishop's delegate? Ah, good, not me, the parish priest. All right? Don't say my spiritual director, Father Michael, CCR spiritual director. Your parish priest is above me. All right, I guide the CCR. He guides you as a parishioner. Your soul is in his hand. It's his responsibility. It's something you cannot even begin to imagine. The responsibility that he has. And he may joke and fool. But I can tell you, I know many, many parish priests. In fact, most of them who take their job very seriously. Very seriously. They are torn between this and that and all kinds of things. It is a difficult job. It is a difficult job to balance emotions. It is a difficult job to balance groups that are contrasting. And yet, he has to care not for the well-being of the parish, that the parish is functioning well. He has to care for the souls of everyone. The definition for the parish priest in the code of canon law is that a parish priest is one who looks after souls. Souls. Not just your physical well-being. Your soul. So you can imagine the responsibility on him. And how much more the responsibility is on the bishop. Because he's in charge of everybody in the diocese. All the good, all the bad and all the correct. Everybody. And so obedience to the bishop is of the highest importance. Next, my parish priest. And very often is our ah, parish priest is not listening, parish priest is not doing this. Are you listening? Are you listening? Am I listening? Very often sometimes I can get upset about say the bishops, about this, oh they should have done this, they should have done that. And every time I go through this, there's only one question that my spiritual director asks me. Have you listened? Have you obeyed? And immediately the light comes on. I've goofed up. You see, when we don't obey, then we put it on to somebody else. Because we can't blame ourselves, no? But the spiritual director points out these things. And so this is really important. Obedience. 
obedience, transparency, recognize that you are the face of the charismatic movement in your parish. The only thing that your parishioners will ever know about the charismatic movement is you, is your prayer group. So don't be an embarrassment to the CCR. Having said this, I also want to tell you that this is not only about you know cracking the whip. This isn't, this is about being honest. And this is about telling you that we are here to help you. And we too need help. And that is why we are having these meetings time and again because we too want to listen where we have goofed up. Sometimes I may not be able to point these things out to my spiritual director because I have forgotten. But maybe someone has been roughed up wrongly, has been rubbed the wrong way. Bring it up. Bring it up. Give us a chance to apologize, to make amends. We too need to be honest. We too need to be true. We too need to be like Jesus. Okay, so this is the first talk. It deals with the roots of the CCR. But before we go into the movement, we go into the person. Who am I? What am I called to do? What is the meaning of being charismatic? A charismatic over and above a normal Christian develops these aspects. Transparency, obedience, spreading the word of God, the kingdom of God and using the charisms to build up the body of Christ in the church. Four very simple definitions of who a charismatic person is. If one of these is missing, I am not charismatic. I may be part of the charismatic group, but I am not charismatic. Okay? To be led by the Holy Spirit is to be honest. You recognize the risk we take. So Mervyn was conducting the praise and worship. And at the end of the worship time, what did he say? Does anyone have a word of knowledge? You know how dangerous that is? If somebody wants to get even with you, he'll get a lot of words which are very knowledgeable. But notice what happens when you're honest. You say one thing, you say one thing, you say one thing. And how all of them intersect. All of them come from different perspectives, through the minds of different people. They are filtered through their minds, through the words, etc. But because it's guided by the Spirit, it intersects at one point. That is where honesty lies. You may have different opinions, I may have different opinions, he or she may have different opinions. But what is the Spirit saying? The book of Revelation, the letters to the churches, Listen to what the Spirit is saying. Listen. Listen. That's the whole point. We are called to be listeners and then doers. First thing is to listen to what the Spirit is calling us to do. And second, we go out in doing what is required. Okay? So quickly, any questions that you have? I've got another five minutes. It's a little more than that, yeah. So I've basically laid out what it means to be a charismatic person, all right? The need for a spiritual director, uh, Bishop Barthol will come in the evening and he'll speak about that a little more, just a short input, okay? And we are, um, as part of going back to the basics, we are going back through all these things, rediscovering our, our roots, okay? Because these are areas that are important and these are areas that need to be rediscovered. Not to say that you are not honest, not to say that you are not transparent, but you must focus on these and become even more honest and even more transparent. Because we don't represent the prayer group, we represent Jesus. If we goof up, we give Jesus a bad name. That is what is important. Not my prayer group leader, not Father Michael, not Patrick, not the CCR, BSC, whatever. I represent Jesus and if I do something wrong, if I'm an embarrassment, I'm an embarrassment to Jesus. Our calling is to be perfect like our Heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, any questions quickly on anything that I've said, maybe need a little more clarification on some things.
Yes. Uh, yes, very good. So, what sacrifices? So, I, I distinguish sacrifice from saying, I'm not speaking of sacrifice as uh, something that I've done, some good deed that I've done. Okay? So, for example, I've helped somebody cross the road. It is a sacrifice because I was going somewhere else, but then I... But the sacrifice we're talking about here is a sacrifice for Jesus. I wanted to rest. But there was somebody who needed to be counseled at that point. Okay? I gave up my privilege in order to reach out to that person. Sacrifice. I was upset. But I swallowed my pride and I went and said sorry because that is what Jesus would expect of me. Sacrifice. Okay? So, the sacrifice we are speaking about is what I have done for Jesus. Okay? So... As we grow in this, even crossing that road will be a sacrifice for Jesus. But we are at a very nascent state, at a basic, basic state. For Mother Teresa, she would say, I don't reach out to this person because I am being paid. I do it because I see Christ in that person. That is the ultimate goal. If we can do that already, fantastic. Okay, but that is not going to really be possible right now where we are in our spiritual life. For some of us, perhaps. Okay, so clear what I mean by sacrifice? What am I doing because of Jesus? And I must actually start doing that. No? So when I wake up in the morning, okay, normally what we do at the end of the day, do an examination of conscience. My spiritual director again. I went to him once and I was very happy. I preached this. Did I, I preached it at the ABC meeting, right? Yeah, okay, so you'll know about it, yeah. So he gave me a nice chabuk, you know. He says, huh, why are you wasting your time? So, what good are you going to do today? What are you going to do for Jesus today? That's sacrifice. So ask yourself, you're going for mass in the evening, no? You know you're going for evening mass. Throughout this day, what am I going to take for Jesus? What am I going to offer Jesus? What sacrifice? So when you start looking for opportunities, they will come. Good question. Yes, is there a hand up there? Father, how do you find a spiritual How do you? Find a spiritual director. How do you find a spiritual director? Good question. Uh, one is, yeah. One is that uh, you look for someone who displays honesty, uh, a sense of holiness, and a love for Jesus. These three aspects. Okay, so the person must be in love with Jesus. That's the first thing. Otherwise, he or she is going to take you somewhere else. Alright? Second, the person must be honest. Uh, not self-righteous, but honest. Willing to call a spade a spade. No? And third, there should be an aspect of holiness to that person. An aspect of holiness. A spiritual director need not be a priest or a nun. Okay, need not be a priest or a nun. Okay, it can be anybody. Sometimes in the parish, I find some people, some grandmothers who are really, really holy. I feel ashamed. Because some of them, I, every time I meet them, I say, you are an inspiration to me. And they blush and say, what, Father? And I say, Kale Mundai, Father. Hey, okay. But no, it's true. It's true. Sometimes, uh, we are called to greater holiness as priests. We are called to greater meaning, deeper. Okay? Deeper and deeper into Jesus. You are called to prayer, we are called to even more prayer. You are called to sacrifice, we are called to even more sacrifice. So everything that you are called to, we are called to something greater. Alright, so I must do that much more as a priest. Okay, but that is, uh, that is not a sacrifice that I make, that is a privilege for me. Okay, so I hope I've answered that question. Yeah. Father, first point you said, second is honesty, aspect of holiness and justice. For what? Uh, how do you find a spiritual love for Jesus? Uh, love for Jesus, love for Jesus. Yes, any more questions? 
So I want to invite you to find a spiritual director, okay, if you don't already have one. If you're using that person as a confessor and a spiritual director, maybe you need to talk to that person and say, this is what I expect of you from confession. This is what I expect of you as a spiritual director. Okay, so please pull me up. Okay, and you need to be honest with that person for that person to be able to tell you where you're wrong. Okay, so find your spiritual director. Let us know who your spiritual director is. Okay, so if, if the spiritual director of the group is your spiritual director, then make sure you're going for spiritual direction. Okay, not just, uh, he's a, Paris is a pontiff spiritual director, so he's my spiritual director. No, personally, personally, okay. I am spiritual director of the CCR in Mumbai. Doesn't mean I am the individual spiritual, spiritual director of all the members of the English Council, the Bombay Service Team, no. I am of the group. My job is to tell the group where they are going wrong. Right? But individually I may not be. Right? I may not be. Yes. 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 And you need to tell that person what do you mean by spiritual director? Because very often, sometimes even we priests take it for granted. Okay, this is what the people mean generally. They use all these big words, but this is what they really mean. So when the priest knows he really means spiritual direction, then he will be a little more uh, uh, precise in what he's saying. Is there a, is there a difference between a mentor and a spiritual director? Yeah, a mentor is generally for a task or uh, how to improve a certain skill, you know. So I learn praise and worship and then I have a mentor. So as I'm doing it, the mentor is like backing me up, teaching me this, that. That's not at all what the spiritual director does. No, the spiritual director is to show direction. What about the ladies who go to the ladies and... Gents? So you can go to anybody who are you comfortable with. Okay, it's not that ladies need to go to ladies, gents need to go to gents. Ladies can go to gents, gents can, gents can go to ladies, etc. Absolutely no problem. Because if your spiritual director has these three qualities, you're perfectly safe. Okay, you're perfectly safe. No one is there going to take you for a ride. Or everybody must check the, for these three qualities. If you know that someone is a womanizer, and you're a woman, please don't go there. Okay, you're asking for trouble. Alright, you're asking for trouble. So if you know somebody is not very honest, don't go to that person. Okay, because you are aiming for greater holiness, that person will actually pull you down. Okay, so be very clear. And sometimes spiritual directors come in disguise. Okay, they appear very jolly, but actually they are very tough. Okay, so don't go, don't judge a book by its cover. Sometimes I know some people look and act completely correct. But they are excellent spiritual directors, excellent. Okay, I think we are done. Yes, oh, sorry. I thought you were doing something with the camera. Uh, just something further, because what was much earlier than you was in terms of spiritual direction. Okay? Ladies can go to ladies. Okay? Elderly uh, ladies <coughs> in our parish can be amended to a gen. But never the gent of a lady. They say a priest, yes, but it's because that always opens up, they say a lay person. Correct. So just to be cautious, I I don't know all the things you say, a womanizer or this or that, I, I don't know that. So as a rule of thumb, this was always suggested. Yes, that is what we suggest, but as, as a general, there is no rule in that sense, okay? It's, it's what we suggest because generally, a woman would also be more, fa more open and familiar with a woman, no? That's what we uh, expect, that's what we assume, right? It's not always the case, right? But uh, uh, this is what you should be looking for. Uh, more, than, more than the gender, I think what you need to be looking for are those three things, right? Holiness of life, love for Jesus, and deadly honest. Okay, three things. Uh, if those three things are there, you're more or less safe, okay? But 
uh, feel free to go whom you're comfortable with. So we encourage women to go with women. Now there are all these problems of molestation, etc., all these kind of things. Uh, and therefore we don't, that has been there in the past, we don't recommend these things, etc. But there is no hard and fast rule about this, okay? If you're very clear about certain things, if you're sure of that person, just go to anybody. Okay, but don't put yourself in harm's way. Don't put yourself in harm's way. If you have even the slightest of doubt, get out of that place. Okay, very clear. You must realize why you are there and the person uh, directing you should know why he or she is there. And as long as both of you know why you are there, nothing wrong will happen. It is the spirit of Jesus will guide us. Okay, I am done. Yes. How often uh, is a question very difficult to answer, uh, but by means of suggestion, I would I go once a month or once if I can't make it then once in two months. Uh, depends on what you're dealing with and what you're handling. Okay, I'm handling a number of things and I need to unload a whole lot of things, so I go often. How often do you need to go to confession? The question is really how often do I need to go to a doctor? Every time I fall sick or can I manage certain things by myself, right? If I think I need to go very often, I need to go very often, okay? So that's something that you'll have to judge case to case, okay? Depending on what you're handling. Good? Okay, come. Mother, the oath has been put in terms to the oath what is done. Uh, yeah, if anybody wants to see the oath, okay, and read it, you can uh, look at it, it will be put up on the screen, so you know what oath uh, your leaders have taken, okay, so this is what you must expect of them, and in turn, this is what they are going to expect of you, okay, so this is what we've got to keep each other in check all the time, Father, this is what I expect of you, okay, and I'll say the same thing, this is what I expect of you. That's how we grow in honesty, we grow in openness, okay? Recognize that we are all equal, equal, okay? Christ is the head, all of us are the body. It's not that the hand is more important than the foot. Christ is most important. I'll send it on the leaders group so that they can tell you.